Hello everyone! First of all, disclaimer, this video is going to be just for fun. None of these things are legitly confirmed or anything like that, it's just my opinions. Most of my videos are just for fun. So when I first started getting into this watch collecting hobby, or this watch consumerism hobby, however you want to call it, I started watching a lot of YouTube, right? That nowadays that's just how we gain information, we use the internet. As bad or as good as that is, information is so easily accessible now. So I watched a lot of different watch YouTubers and had a blast with that. What's really interesting is... I feel like every single watch YouTuber has a watch that they're very commonly associated with. Or when I think of this watch tuber, YouTuber, I think of that watch. And obviously people can disagree or, you know, some of you may even agree. Tell me what you guys think when you watch this video, if you feel like a watch YouTuber is actually more associated with a different watch. But I'm going to run down the list give you guys specs and everything, my opinion of that watch, and we'll just wrap it all up at the end, just for fun again. All of these YouTubers will have links to their channel in the description below. If any of you guys don't want to be in this video, or if you happen to watch this video and don't want to be in it, let me know, I'll try to take it out of the video. So first off, we have the Teddy Baldassar. The watch that comes immediately to mind for me when talking about Teddy, is the Young Hans Maxville Chronoscope. I feel like everyone who's watched this channel probably at some point owned a Maxville or wanted to own a Maxville or at least think about owning a Maxville. I for one had a Maxville for um, a little while, a couple months probably. I had the small hand wound 34 millimeter Young Hans Maxville. It was great wasn't exactly to my liking but i still have that urge for for the chrono uh, i probably wanted the chrono to begin with but i couldn't afford it at the time which i guess is is a good lesson to learn to just get the watch you want just wait and save up for that watch that you want instead of getting a replacement for that itch the chronoscope is a great watch especially getting a chronograph at that price point that's mechanical is is amazing you're getting a nice Bauhaus designed watch this watch features a nice big dome crystal and with the little pushers on the side it really reminds me of just an elegant light bulb pretty much it has a case diameter of 40 millimeters with a lug to lug of 42 millimeters thickness of 14.4 millimeters which makes this watch easily accessible and most people can wear this watch with that short lug to lug the only thing is the diameter is a little misleading because of that thin bezel that watch is mostly dial so it's a little bit bigger than a 40 millimeter but since it's lug to lug is so small i think that's what really matters and at the end of the day i think we need a new dimension to be honest for watch wearers we should probably do something more like surface area or something. Maybe I'll make a video on that later. This watch has two sub dials. The first one counting the minutes elapsed. The second one counting the hours elapsed. Go up to 12 hours, which is great. You can get it for around $2,000. But honestly, if you wait for sales and everything off Joma shop or even other dealers, you can probably get it for a little bit north of $1,000. Next up, we have Adrian Barker from originally Bark and Jack. For me, when I think of Adrian, I think of the Rolex Explorer 1 just because of how much he loves that watch. You can just see it in his eyes and hear it in his voice. It's a really nice voice. This guy also just sells us the Rolex Explorer 1 so well. I feel like the amount of times that he's 
made me or someone else want a Rolex Explorer one, he should honestly Rolex should just give him uh, a cut of uh, of the profits from the Rolex Explorer at this point. I think the Rolex Explorer doesn't need any introduction. At the end of the day, it is a Rolex. It is probably one of the most under the radar Rolex there is. If you walked outside and there wasn't, you know, another watch enthusiast, they wouldn't look at that and immediately think it's a Rolex. There's no signs of that. There's no fluted bezel. There's no Cyclops date window. The current Rolex Explorer in this at the time that this video is made is 36 millimeter in diameter. I actually think it's a little bit smaller than that. Where is a little smaller, which is pretty interesting. It, it, it can fit almost any wrist and I think it looks way better in a 36 millimeter diameter due to the design of the dial. What I mean by that is that they don't have to force certain letterings and like the numbers, the indices to a really weird dimension just to fill the dial without the dial looking really empty. It is, you know, a plain black dial. So most of the design comes from the logo, the fonts, the lettering, the spacing, and just the 369 and the indices, right? I think what's great about this watch is that it really is an Explorer watch, right? It at least has a water resistance of 100 meters. It's crystal, it's a sapphire flat, sapphire crystal. And it, it really looks like a daily wear that you can wear to anything. You can wear it in really formal events. At the same time, you can wear it to the most casual <laughs> events that you can think of. And I think that's really great versatility. I think what's really special about this watch also is that it has the glide lock mechanism that Rolex has, which has that really long uh, on the fly adjustment, which is really cool. But of course it's a Rolex again, when that comes with pros and cons and whether or not you can get it, well, psst. You guys should look into vintage. The next person I have on my list is Jenny L, which deserves a round of applause. For me, it's another Rolex. It's her pink Rolex Oyster Perpetual. As she said many times in her other videos, it's a very special Rolex to her. I think my opinions on the Oyster Perpetual is that it's a really great watch for the price especially retail since I don't think Rolexes are actually worth much more than retail. But the problem is a lot of people, you know, they don't see the Oyster Perpetual as uh, a legitimate Rolex watch for some reason. Maybe it's because it's one of their cheaper lines. People at least want a Datejust or more. But in my opinion, I don't think the Oyster Perpetual is anything less than a date just. The OP comes in various sizes, which means you get to pick the one that will fit your wrist the best, at least theoretically, if you can get one. Because even now, the OPs are also in demand. Probably one of the easier ones you can get though. I think a lot of people also knock on the OP because of the fact that it looks a little bland, but with all the recent colorings and all the different models of the OP, I think that Jenny L's being pink really does spice things up a bit. At the end of the day though, I think the OPs are just as qualified as a Rolex watch as any other watch that Rolex produces, just because it's a little bit below in price point compared to their other models, doesn't make it not a Rolex watch. I think in a way, if you think about it, it's that Rolex does hold a status symbol, right? and people do care about the Rolex status symbol. If they don't actually believed in that Rolex status symbol, then the OP is just as qualified. If the price point didn't matter, then the OP is just as qualified. The quality of Rolex is still there. It's still a Rolex watch and everything about the design language, it's still Rolex. You know, I'd argue that it's more Rolex than the other Rolex watches, at least, compared to what they used to be, that they were actually a tool watch meant to be used. Next up on the list, I have Theo and Harris. So I split them into two. The first off being Christian. For me and I'm sure for many people, it's his Rolex they just in blue 1601. It's a vintage date just. 
it's kind of what sparked him into the game. And you know, you guys can go watch my vintage Rolex argument video that I've made. But I think Christian really put vintage watches back on the map. I mean, not that it's ever been off the map, but I don't think it's been completely appreciated yet either. I think vintage Rolex is kind of where it's at right now if you're trying to go for a Rolex. And it, it contains all of those Rolex design languages, plus the fact that I think it's actually the least obscured version of their design language. It's when they got to be creative. It's when they were still hungry and trying to do what other brands haven't yet. The vintage Rolex blue date just is beautiful, especially the white gold fluted bezel. And there's just not much more I can say about that than I haven't really covered in the other video. The second person is Michael. For me, it's his Nomos. I think he ended up getting a different watch from Nomos, but the one that's always in my head is the Nomos Club Campus, just because he's actually made a video on it. It's, it was a great video, by the way, you guys should check that out. Nomos is a super underrated German brand. Um, it's up and coming. I think people are really starting to get into Nomos, especially in the watch community. They have also Bauhaus design, and the fact that I think Nomos kind of has that funk that Young Hans doesn't exactly give you or other German watchmakers won't give you. Um, I think it's great. Nomos also does really well with their movements. The club campus also features a couple different case diameters. I believe 36 millimeters and a 38.5 millimeters. Their lug to lugs are a bit longer. Nomos tends to have longer lug to lugs. In this case, they have 47.5 and 48.9 millimeters respectively. So not a huge difference, but you know, when watches come down to millimeter by millimeter, especially when you're talking surface area on a wrist, it's it, it can make a big difference, a bigger difference than you would think. And honestly, one of the things that I love about Nomus is the fact that it kind of treads that line of dressy versus casual, um, especially since they do make a lot of their watches really water resistant so you can use it as an everyday watch however you deem it fit the club campus features 100 meters water resistance so the same level as the rolex explorer now it's not insane but it's pretty good for a watch like this especially with its thinness next up we have mr talking hands from watch finder i think he actually recently started his own youtube channel so I'm going to have to find that and link that in the description too. For me, the watch that he reminds me of is has to be a Grand Seiko. And the only watch that he has from Grand Seiko right now is the Grey Beast. This one is so special in the fact that it has Grand, one of Grand Seiko's quartz movements, which people go, quartz? Excuse me? But if anybody has watched his videos or have watched other Grand Seiko videos, they know that Grand Seiko's quartz are special. They're usually thermoregulated. Their accuracy is insane, even for quartz. And I think that people are really missing out on quartz movements, especially since there are some really good quartz movements meant to last over decades of time now. They can be serviced and they're meant to last instead of being disposable. Unfortunately, the Grey Beast is something that you can't just get anymore. You can get it secondhand, but you can't just buy it off Grand Seiko. Christian really put vintage watches back on the map. I mean, not that it's ever been off the map, but I don't think it's been completely appreciated yet either. I think vintage Rolex is kind of where it's at right now if you're trying to go for a Rolex and it, it contains all of those Rolex design languages, plus the fact that I think it's actually the least obscured version of their design language. It's when they got to be creative, it's when they were still hungry and trying to do what other brands haven't yet. The vintage Rolex blue date just is beautiful, especially the white gold fluted bezel, and there's just not much more I can say about that that I haven't really covered in the other video. 
the second person is Michael. For me, it's his Nomos. I think he ended up getting a different watch from Nomos, but the one that's always in my head is the Nomos Club Campus, just because he's actually made a video on it. It's, it was a great video, by the way. You guys should check that out. Nomos is a super underrated German brand. Um, it's up and coming. I think people are really starting to get into Nomos, especially in the watch community. They have also Bauhaus design, and the fact that I think Nomos kind of has that funk that Young Hans doesn't exactly give you or other German watchmakers won't give you. Um, I think it's great. Nomos also does really well with their movements. The Club Campus also features a couple different case diameters. I believe 36 millimeters and a 38.5 millimeters. Their lug to lugs are a bit longer. Nomos tends to have longer lug to lugs. In this case, they have 47.5 and 48.9 millimeters respectively. So not a huge difference, but you know, when watches come down to millimeter by millimeter, especially when you're talking surface area on a wrist, it's it, it can make a big difference, a bigger difference than you would think. And honestly, one of the things that I love about Nomos is the fact that it kind of treads that line of dressy versus casual, um, especially since they do make a lot of their watches really water resistant, so you can use it as an everyday watch, however you deem it fit. The Club Campus features 100 meters water resistance, so the same level as the Rolex Explorer. Now it's not insane, but it's pretty good for a watch like this, especially with its thinness. Next up we have Mr. Talking Hands from Watch Finder. I think he actually recently started his own YouTube channel, so I'm going to have to find that and link that in the description too. For me, the watch that he reminds me of is has to be a Grand Seiko, and the only watch that he has from Grand Seiko right now is the Grey Beast. This one is so special in the fact that it has Grand, one of Grand Seiko's quartz movements, which people go, quartz? Excuse me? But if anybody has watched his videos or have watched other Grand Seiko videos, they know that Grand Seiko's quartz are special. They're usually thermoregulated. Their accuracy is insane, even for quartz. And I think that people are really missing out on quartz movements, especially since there are some really good quartz movements meant to last over decades of time now they can be serviced and they're meant to last instead of being disposable unfortunately the gray beast is something that you can't just get anymore you can get it second hand but you can't just buy it off grand seiko the gray beast is also known as the sbg v245j it still has that zeratsu polishing its dial is still really great. It's not the same as other Grand Seiko watches, but I think that simplicity actually kind of pushes this watch into its own realm too. To give you an idea of how accurate the quartz is, it's plus minus 10 seconds per year. Most watchmakers, even Rolex is plus minus two seconds per day, right? So if you really do the calculations, what's that? two times 30, which is a month, that's 60. That's already 60 seconds difference per month. The Grand Seiko Great Beast has diameter 40 millimeters, lug to lug 47.1 millimeters, which is also a pretty versatile size. It has 200 meters of water resistance. So move aside Rolex Explorer you know, we have a watch that is able to do a lot more, 200 meters. I mean, being completely honest, as a, as a normal folk, we won't ever really get to use that. But it's just kind of nice to know. I guess that's just what happens when you get too into the watch world. This watch also has reinforced magnetic resistance. There's another plus, pretty cool. One of watches, if you ask a watchmaker, one of watches biggest antagonists would be magnets. Lastly, I have your terrific. He is pretty terrific. I love his takes on videos and the way he does his videos. They're amazing. And for me, the watch that he reminds me of is 
the Cartier Santos. That's right, even if you sold it, it's still going to stick with me at least. That <laughs> That is your watch. That is the watch that your terrific reminds me of. The Cartier Santos has an elegant design that pretty much is able to take Cartier into a different realm that's not just dressy. It definitely pushes it into an everyday watch realm. It still has and retains the, the Cartier design language along with the fact that it has really shiny bezels, which is also uh, kind of a con with all the scratches, but it's really pretty. And honestly, what's to life if you're going to end up worrying about the scratches anyways. Now the dimensions are a bit tricky to talk about because it is a square watch, which again, which is why I think we should do surface area, not do just lug to lug or just dimensions like horizontally across the watch face. I think surface area would make more sense. The diameter though is 39.8 millimeters and it is super thin with 9.08 millimeters. At least this is the large model. They do have a smaller model, which most people would probably be able to do better. I think part of what makes and pushes this into that sporty category is the fact that it does have a hundred meter water resistance and the fact that they kind of make a semi-integrated bracelet with it. Another steel sports watch. I think it's really cool. I thought about getting one at some point, but it just doesn't exactly click with how I envision my watch collection to be. But let me know what you guys think. Did your terrific successfully abandon the Cartier Santos by selling it or is it still his watch? And that's it for this video guys. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you guys put all these watches together actually, they would make a pretty interesting collection. A lot of Rolex, but overall not too not too shabby. You get a chronograph in there, you get a dressy watch in there, and you get a bunch of well-rounded everyday watches. If I didn't mention you in this video, it doesn't mean I don't watch you by the way. I just don't have a strong opinion on what watch you may remind me of i do watch a lot of watch youtubers and so and i appreciate all the content out there it keeps me entertained while i'm on the <laughs>